started today. And um, it is it is my pleasure and my honor to uh, introduce um, two of my fellow um, Department of Veterans Affairs, Veterans Health Administration leader coaches, who I met uh, last year through our, our leader coaching subgroup. And we are really uh, privileged to have both of them talk with us today. And they've presented this work um, previously on tips on publishing and presenting somewhat related to high reliability organization uh, progress and work, but applicable to all types of publishing and, and presenting. So we have Dr. John Murray, and John has served in, um, if, you, if you look at his resume, which I'm not going to read, but he served in many, many leadership positions in the pediatric world, in education, in military health systems, in civilian health systems. And I really wanted to commend you, John, on, on what you had included about um, your work on with the refugee uh, children and resettling them in host countries. And that's just such honorable work. So, so thank you for that. Thank you. Um, we also have, uh, we're also joined by Jeff Yarvis, who is a PhD and he's joining us today from Texas. Um, he's a veteran. He's had 35 years as leading in the veterans affairs system, executive medicine. Um, and he has a great, great passion for improvement and transformation. And without getting into too many of the details, Jeff has it's really, really skilled at going in and, and um, assisting people that are in crisis and tackling really difficult situations and helping turn those around. So two really fascinating um, people that are joining us today. And without uh, uh, further ado, I'll turn it over to John, who's going to start off for us. Great. Thank please, you very please. much, Lisa. And good afternoon, everyone. You can go to the next slide, please. So we have two overarching um, objectives for the purposes of this presentation. The first is really to recognize some, what we have found to be some very helpful tips for publishing and presenting. And then we would also like to, to share um, some places where you can find resources to help with uh, publishing and presenting. And um, we, this also applies to co-publishing and co-presenting, which is a lot of the work that we do with um, the Veterans Health Administration. We spend a lot of time mentoring people um, with publishing and presenting. Next, please. So as everyone knows, the really the, the, the overarching goal for publishing and presenting is really to advance the state of the science, but it's um, helpful to recognize that there are a lot of different um, barriers um, or challenges to this process. And we think that by recognizing these barriers, um, it, it really helps individuals to increase their chances of um, getting published or having uh, abstracts accepted for, pub, uh, for presentation. Um, certainly this results in enhancing professional profiles and certainly um, also leads to uh, career progression for many people who work in academia and, and research, as well as clinical practice. Next, please. So these are probably the most um, important um, tips for publishing and presenting. Um, I know that I share this with um, with students all the time. I, I teach doctoral students at Northeastern University. And the first is that to remember not to, re, um, to rush submitting a manuscript of publication or abstract for, um, for review. It's always important to remember that um, regardless of whether you're working on a, a publication or presentation, that it's a multi-step um, process. And it can be overwhelming, especially for people with experience. Um, I've been publishing and presenting for over 30 years now, and I still run into circumstances that can be a little bit overwhelming. So the, the, the most important thing is to, to be patient, to recognize that publishing and presenting is a journey. Um, what I share with individuals that I teach and mentor all the time is to um, recognize that it's an in incremental progress. And that if you work on it a little bit every day or a little bit every few days, then you'll eventually get to a fully written manuscript or um, presentation. And then anytime you publish or, or present, it really is a, a, a great opportunity um, to learn about the processes for doing both. Next, please. So 
So some of the other um, tips for publishing and presenting that are really helpful is the first is to really spend a, a, a enough time looking for an appropriate publication outlet or a presentation venue. Um, doing so will, will dramatically increase your chances of um, getting accepted for publication or presentation. And you really wanna make sure that you have a good idea of who your target audience is going to be. Um, we recommend that, that for new or inexperienced authors that you really don't focus a whole lot on impact factor, really look at which audience will, will best learn from um, the information that you have to share. Um, we strongly recommend that individuals re reach out to colleagues to ask for suggestions and feedback. And we're gonna share with you one of the ways in which we do that when, with our work through the Veterans Health Administration. Um, use any and all available resources. Um, again, we are going to um, share with you some of the resources that we have available. And um, Lisa, these are certainly um, resources that you can share with, with everybody on the call as well. Um, and then the other thing that, that's really important is to make sure that you determine um, early on the order of authorship. If you are writing um, with other people or putting together a, a presentation with other people, this is really the best way to make sure that, um, that, that um, the, the credit is genuine and it's given to um, those individuals based on um, their contributions to the publication or the presentation. And we wanna make sure that, that the order of authorship is fair and transparent. And I'll give you um, some suggestions for um, how, to, how to take a look at that in, in a couple of minutes. Next slide, please. So this is the, the template that we use with our, um, with our clients in uh, Veterans Health Administration. And anyone who's interested in publishing or presenting, we give them this uh, template for them to give us a little bit of an understanding of what they'll be working on, to include an AIM statement, um, identifying whether it's going to be a manuscript that they're working on or a presentation, who they think the anticipated um, audience will be, um, if, if you're thinking of publishing, what journal do you have in mind? And then asking individuals um, what kind of resources might be, um, might be needed and what kind of assistance might, might be needed with co-publishing uh, co and, and co-presenting. Next slide, please. And these are some of the, the one, page, um, one pages we put together to help individuals with publishing and presenting. Um, one is, um, dedicated to really identifying the factors that need to be taken into consideration when you're selecting the right journal for publication. Um, the steps in submitting a, a manuscript, and um, we, do, we do make note that these do um, vary a little bit depending on the, um, the venue for the publication or if it's a, if it's a presentation, the, the, the conference, but there are certain steps that are pretty familiar to um, all venues. And then we give an example of you know, what, what a checklist um, looks like um, as you're preparing to submit your, um, your manuscript for review. And then for those who may not have uh, presented a poster before, just some um, suggestions for to how to lay out um, a poster. Next, please. So this is what um, I was referring to when um, I spoke about authorship. The International Committee of Medical Journal Educator um, Guidelines are really the, 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 the best guidelines to, to use when you're, when you're determining authorship. Um, the four criteria that, that need to be met um, are pretty, pretty straightforward and, and pretty clear. Um, everybody who contributes to the manuscript or to the presentation um, should have made sub substantial contributions to the, the work, whether that be um, the conceptualization or the design of the project. Um, it could be the acquisition of, of data, um, the analysis of data, interpretation. And then the second thing is that everyone who is um, being considered a co-author really has to play a critical role in revising um, the manuscript or the abstract for presentation and providing the final approval. And then what you want to have happen at the end of all of this is that everyone who is considered to be a co-author or co-presenter agrees to be accountable for all aspects of, of the document, whether that be a publication or a presentation. 
Next, please. So when you look at authorship, typically um, the first individual um, indicates the person with the highest status of authorship. This varies depending on the, um, the project that's being worked on. So for example, um, typically the, the, the last person listed is the, is, the senior, um, is the senior author who has senior status. This is usually the person who serves as the mentor or the supervisor for the writing project, whether it be a manuscript or a publication. And this does vary. So for example, um, recently I helped um, three novice um, writers to develop a manuscript and um, the, the three co-authors didn't ha, hadn't published before. And so you don't wanna put somebody in the position of being the first author who has to respond to the editor as needed um, when they haven't had the experience with doing it previously. And then if you have, a, if you have a, other individuals who have contributed to the manuscript, but really haven't made major contributions, um, it's, it's still important to recognize them. And we typically do this through um, recognizing them as contributing authors in the acknowledgments um, section. Next. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, if individuals don't meet all of the ICMJE criteria, they really should not um, be listed. They should be acknowledged as contributors. Next, please. Um, so some of the tips for pu pu publishing and presenting is really you want to take the time to read the aim, scope, and guidelines associated with the, the journal, journal that you're uh, thinking of um, submitting to. And you want to do this, number one, uh, thoroughly, and you want to do it more than once. Um, and you would think that journal to journal, there wouldn't be a whole, whole lot of variability, but sometimes there is. And so you really want to take time to do this. There was a really... Um, um, great uh, publication that was put out two years ago that showed that one in five manuscripts um, do not follow the style and the format requirements of the, the target journal. And unfortunately, um, there are journals who, if you do not follow the um, submission guidelines, they just automatically um, re reject the, um, the manuscript and don't want to see it back. And so you really want to uh, avoid doing that. And while it, it, while it sounds like it's, um, you know, mean to do that. We have to remember that many members of editorial boards and many individuals who review uh, manuscripts for publication or abstracts for presentations, um, they do this on their own time. So uh, we wanna make sure that, we're, um, that we take into consideration in um, the work that people are doing on their own time. Next, please. Um, the other thing that um, used to be pretty common is to be able to submit a query letter to the editor of a journal. And this is just to, to see if the editor thinks that the topic of interest, um, that the topic of the manuscript would be of interest to the readership. Um, unfortunately, more and more um, editors of journals are no longer accepting uh, query letters. Um, and again, this is because of the, you know, the high demands that are placed on them as um, editors or um, editorial teams. And so you really want to make sure that if, if you're thinking about sending a query letter, that you look at the author guidelines to see if they do indeed um, accept query letters. And as I mentioned previously, fewer and fewer do. Next, please. Okay, so just some quick tips for um, preparing the manuscript. I'll get started and, and Jeff will pick it up. Next, please. So when you think about the, the title, this is really the first thing that an editor or a reviewer sees. And so you want to make sure that, um, that you make a good first impression. And so, you know, spend a, a good amount of time um, coming up with, with the title to make sure that it really does reflect the main theme of the manuscript. Um, you also want it to reflect uh, the kind of contribution that, that an author is making to the state of the science. So for example, if it's qualitative study, quantitative study, that that's noted in the title, um, it might be that you're doing a systematic review or an integrative review, and so that should be part of the, the title as well. You want to avoid the use of jargon, especially abbreviations, because abbreviations that might be familiar to us um, may not be familiar to other people. And the really nice thing about um, titles is that oftentimes they, um, 
they change during the the process of of writing and 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 reviewing. And there are there are times when when reviewers come back and make make suggestions for ways to um, you know make the the, the manuscript um, the title of the manuscript one that um, does a better job of highlighting to the potential readership um, what the author is covering. Next, please. So um, the abstract, these are the, the guidelines. Many of you are, are, are familiar with them, I'm sure. Um, you wanna make sure that you um, identify the aim and scope, uh, the key problem that is going to be addressed, um, the method used, um, the, the data set, um, how it was collected, how it was analyzed, what are your key findings, um, limitations and implications. And again, the, the format for abstracts can vary um, from journal to journal or from presentation um, venue to presentation venue. And so you wanna make sure that you follow the guidelines that are, that are made available um, so that you format it in the correct, the correct manner. Uh, this is another place where if, if the guidelines aren't followed, uh, the people who review the, the, the formatting of the manuscripts um, will send it back to the, to, the, um, to the corresponding author before it even gets to the, to the editor. Next, please. And then the other thing that you want to do is really take time to identify um, some of the keywords. And the keywords are really helpful with um, individuals that are searching the literature um, for information on a particular topic. Um, it helps to, helps to identify them a little bit more easier for, um, for individuals that are looking at um, previously published research and previously um, presented materials. Next, please. Okay, Jeff, over to you. Fantastic, John, and uh, you know, thanks for a wonderful introduction. And, and like John, this is something I wish I had earlier on in my career. So it's really great that we have the opportunity to speak with you all today about this. Uh, it's something, as John said, I teach at a doctoral program in Tulane uh, down in New Orleans and students really struggle with this and get impatient. So uh, I think John set you up for a really great way of thinking about this. Um, so now how do you get going on the paper? And you know, the introduction sounds like a fairly simple exercise, but actually um, we should really come to a good understanding from the introduction about what the entire paper is going to be about. What's the thesis of the paper? What's the compelling problem that it's gonna be addressing? And what's the purpose of the uh, article? And what do I hope to gain from understanding this? Because uh, a lot of times in our work, uh, we, we sit with gray matter and, and readers will be convinced that they know something about the topic and hopefully you're gonna be shedding light on that and what's significant and different about it. Next slide, please. And so um, this is really important and it's something that really uh, gets writers worried, especially if they've written, they're writing the paper from a thesis or a dissertation or some kind of capstone, distilling down their methodology into succinct terms is really, really important. And they should be aligned with the goals and purposes uh, stated. And so in some ways, the methodology is moving the abstract from the introduction into the observable realm and really helping the reader see what's being reported um, and, the, and uh, how reliable these findings are, what statistical findings are. And, and you know, it's important because sometimes, um, we focus on things like uh, statistical significance, but also the meaningfulness of this. So, um, you know, you could prove that owning an Irish setter will make you less stressed out, but that's not very meaningful. So, um, you know, clearly stating what um, you've accomplished uh, by way of the data and how you did it and how this was the right methodology for this particular question. A lot of times people who are writing will say up front. I'll say, what are you trying to write about? And they'll say, well, I'm going to use stu structural equation modeling. And I'll say, well, what's your research question? What's your topic? How is this method the right next step in where the literature left off? Or how does how is this the right methodology to accomplish what you're trying to study? Um, and John mentioned talking about careful use of titles. And one of the other things, especially if you're putting them into a very scientific journal, is does the methodology match the language 
in the title. So for example, if you're using analysis of variance, that's a comparison of means. So the word compare probably will appear in your title. If you're using a, a regression model, which is a predictive model, you might see the word predict in the title. So um, if you're putting it in a very scientific journal versus a qualitative one, you might want to carefully consider the language that you use. Next slide. And uh, the results is where you get to toot your horn a little bit um, and present the information, but there's an art to doing this as well. As John mentioned, identifying the right format for the journal is really important. And, um, and so say you had a couple of different journals in mind and one used uh, the Chicago style and the other used the APA style, you have to change the, the results section to appear the way that style wants you to, just like you do with the language and, and uh, and citation structure of the, of the journal that you're presenting to. And if you don't, as John mentioned, sometimes they'll just kick it right back and maybe not let you submit again. And it's kind of like grant writing if you've ever done that before. You have to be able to say to the journal editors that you know how to follow instructions to some degree. Um, and nowadays, uh, especially for students who are doing the work today, there are many programs like EndNote that will automatically convert manuscripts back and forth. So it's, it's a little bit easier than it was probably when some of us got our degrees uh, to do some of those changes. Um, but basically, you want to follow uh, the, the table and title and uh, uh, format that the uh, journal calls for. And then uh, sometimes, again, distilling down a rather large research project into a manuscript that may only allow 3,000 words is difficult. So you want to avoid repetition and let the picture be worth 1,000 words, as they say. Next slide. And the discussion is really the exciting part because this is where you get to talk about what's important about your work, what was significant, and and even insignificant findings can have heuristic value. And so. Uh, what the discussion should include is a summary of the results and, and their significance and, um, and what's unique about this study, how it adds to the literature, how it joins literature, how it uh, advances a theoretical uh, position, and, and how it advanced previous studies or maybe uh, contradicts a previous study. And then you don't want to go too far on the next one, but you can speculate about unexpected findings. Um, but you want to avoid um, making sweeping generalizations. Um, in your methodology section, in the previous section, you may talk about the number of respondents you had and, and the importance of that number um, in terms of the statistical power that it brings the, to the um, study. And you want to avoid words like proving or causality unless you're really doing a randomized control study in a scientific venue. Um, in the social sciences, that's pretty hard to do. And then, um, of course, you want to acknowledge the limitations of the study and suggest uh, what should be studied going forward. Um, and then you want to punctuate your work by um, restating some of the conclusions. And, and some people, and depending on how much space you have, I just want to circle back for a second and say, Usually people in the methodology will just jump, jump right into the technical piece. If you have a little bit more time, sometimes it's nice to do maybe a four or five sentence lit review of the previous efforts made and how this is the appropriate next step for this particular methodology and why you're using it. Or note that this replication of a previous methodology advances the work in a certain way. So if you have the word count to do that, I like to add a little bit of the why in the methodology section if the journal allows for that. Next slide. Um, the reference list is important, and this is sometimes the tedious part. For me, this really is like fingernails on the blackboard being a little ADHD. And, uh, and so again, I, I rely on that software. I'll pay somebody to edit my work, but this is often the first place I go as an editor, and I sit on several journals because, again, why read the article if the, the basic components and structure are not correct, as John mentioned earlier? And again, I'm a horrible editor of my own work, and so I often will ask somebody else to look at my work. Um, somebody who's very picky because they're quick to find those errors in the uh, formatting. And even when I'm using correct formatting, 
font changes or italics or underlining uh, in the reference area can change depending on the journal. And if you've pulled in references from um, like an online location, sometimes you forget to change that reference or it's hyperlinked and you forget to just, you know, change the hyperlink. And so it'll be a funny color when you do the reference page. So there are little technical things that you really have to pay attention to. And then the number of references can be important because again, if there's a page count, you may have to figure out where to trim the fat a little bit. And so if you have um, a number of citations after a sentence in the body of the work, you may have to uh, trim them down to just uh, the ones that are most recent or the one that was most important that you drew the citation from. But a lot of authors like to include sort of the group of citations, which I enjoy too, because uh, as a researcher, by looking at the citations within a document, I often find uh, the, the eureka moment that I'm looking for when I'm digging for a um, conceptual thing that I'm missing in my paper. So it's a mixed bag, um, but all of the, there's an art to putting all of this together in terms of word count. Okay, next slide. And then uh, again, tips for guideline, you know, make sure that things are very clear. Uh, again, there are all kinds of programs now that allow you to create clear tables and make sure the table actually tells the story you want it to tell. So um, you might want to put these types of things in front of somebody else and say, what do you take away from this? Um, because if it's fairly self-explanatory, then um, that's helpful. Or people will put these kinds of things in a manuscript. And as a reviewer, then I don't see any discussion or explanation of them. So not only are they clear, but are they linked back to the body of the paper at some point? Okay, next one. And then th this is probably the most important thing. And John talked about patience and taking the time to obtain feedback and, and significant criticism. In fact, I would find the person who's going to red ink your manuscript the most. And 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 uh, and I, I have one colleague that springs to mind and he always warns me, I'm going to tear it to pieces. I'm like, good, that's what I need. You know, and so if you're emotionally wed to it, it can hurt your feelings a little bit. Um, I, I always feel like I'm going back to my kindergarten teacher with the big minus red one at the top or something. Um, but obtain that feedback and see if it makes sense to somebody who's not in your field, because if it makes sense to somebody who's not in your field, it's probably written very clearly. Um, we'll talk about revising the manuscript in a moment um, and the importance of feedback that you get from reviewers and ensure uh, that everybody has an opportunity to weigh in on those revisions. So if you're the lead author, you know, when you get feedback on the manuscript, cast it out to all the authors and give them a deadline that you need that feedback by, because you'll be what's called the corresponding author if you're the one engaging the journal man or uh, editors and uh, be responsible for getting back that information in a timely manner. Next. And so um, when you submit a letter, John talked about queries, but sometimes it's it's helpful to let an editor know what your paper's about, why it will contribute. Um, sometimes people will cold call a journal or think that it's aligned to the right theme, but you know you have to find if the journal has like special editions or they're not really running any stories. So it's good to have some familiarity about what they've been doing lately and research the journal itself. Um, John also mentioned, you know, avoiding the impact score as a criteria right now, unless you're seeking tenure uh, and, and really getting it to the audience you think will benefit the most from that. That's always been my MO. Um, and uh, sometimes, it is, you know, there's a, there's a balance between being patient for feedback and waiting too long. I've had journal articles where uh, I presented at a conference, somebody comes up out of the audience and says, I'm from this journal, I'd love to publish. You're like, great, because you think it's gonna be a fairly quick turn. And I had one where it went several years actually in 12 revisions. And I finally said, this isn't even gonna be current anymore. And I upset them when I put it in a different journal um, who was glad to have it. And you know, the impact score was lower, um, but at some point you have to, you know, you have to move on with your life and make decisions about who you really want to benefit from your work. Okay, next one. And this is probably one of the most critical slides in this presentation in terms of uh, what uh, you're doing. Uh, 
again, can you follow instructions? Is it relevant to the journal? Does it provide new information? Does the editorial board think it'll it'll um, inform their readers? Um, is it fair and balanced? You know, are the references current? I have uh, I try to keep it current, but sometimes it's important to have a seminal piece mentioned in it, depending on the topic. Um, you know, so I I've had somewhere you know I've had a date you know in the 1920s, but it's you're almost remiss if you don't mention that that one. But generally speaking, you want uh, the most current research and, and information presented. Uh, invariably, one of the things that I see a lot is references are missing. I think the author in the process of trimming it might leave something out and we need a citation with a, a particular statement. Um, and again, different writing styles impact that. So for example, there's a style called ASA where you assert support and then analyze. And in that style, when you make an assertion, there's usually not a citation, then you support it with the literature and then you analyze the comments you made. In other formats, you may have a citation in the beginning of the paragraphs and end of the paragraphs. So you, you have to understand where to place your citations as well. Of course, nowadays with software like Turnitin, if you're plagiarizing, you, you're going to get caught very easily. Um, and then you'll have no credibility with uh, the organization that you're trying or journal that you're trying to submit with. Um, of course, uh, clarity is important. Um, is the methodology sound and appropriate? Um, and do the conclusions that you've made, uh, are they, I wish I think I feel, or are they actually supported by the results? And uh, and then, you know, having the opportunity to correct any issues with the manuscript will come with what we talk about in the next slide, which is, uh, Responding to you edits. So it's extremely rare, and this is something my students don't understand, to get an immediate acceptance. And if you think about the reviewers, they're like a hammer to a nail. They're going to find something to hammer, you know, so, um, and it's just part of it. So if you get a revise and resubmit, that's really great. Um, and, or they'll send it back and they'll, they'll want major revisions and they won't accept it right away. Um, but the key to revising these are going literally sort of line by line and, and saying, you know, on line six, I'm addressing this comment that this, uh, this reviewer made, and here's what I'm replacing it with. I also want to let people know that you can disagree with some of the reviewer's comments because maybe they don't fully understand the science here. And it's not a place to get into a discourse about why you disagree. In some cases, you can just leave things the same and you can just write, I chose to leave the sentence just the same. If you've just addressed the bulk of their requirements, requests, comments, usually that won't be an issue. You know, if you make wholesale rejections of their comments, chances are you're not gonna get it published, but you can agree to disagree on a, you know, a, a couple of their comments. Uh, it's really important to take the time to address them. A lot of times they just want clarity and they didn't understand what was in your mind's eye when you made the comment and now they understand the context of it. And they're trying to tell you that the same thing could happen to the reader as well. So they're they're trying to help you clarify your work and actually help you be successful in publishing it. It is a long process. Like I said, most of the time, if you address their comments, you'll get you know one or two opportunities for revision and that's it. In some cases, if it's a so-called prestigious journal. It could take six years and of going back and forth. That's probably the most extreme I've personally experienced. And like I said, I bailed on them after that um, because life was starting to get in the way of revising. Um, and of course, uh, giving your co-authors opportunities to help you with those revisions, not only is educational for them, but uh, they can do some of the heavy lifting if you do find yourself getting busy. Um, make sure you follow the deadlines. Again, it's all about following instructions and. Uh, and as I said, it can take some time in multiple rounds. But for the uninitiated who take this personally, they can get very frustrated. Uh, I have a co-author right now who's doing that. And uh, I've been trying, to, she's a recent graduate from a doctoral program trying to make tenure. And she keeps just giving up on the journal and saying, we better find another one. I'm like, no, they, they wanna publish this. And I have to keep explaining, uh, you know, that this is exactly the way it works. Um, next slide, please. And finally, um, you know, there's going to be a proof created. Now, once you get the proof, this is a, 
when you could probably say on your curriculum vitae that it's in press. Uh, it's usually a last opportunity to um, to look at the article as it would appear in the journal. And it usually has like numbers and coding next to it so that if there is a last minute, um, you know, you notice a typo or some type of issue with it, or they've they've changed something that shouldn't have been changed, you have an opportunity to proof it and uh, send your changes back. Once everybody's accepted those changes, it's locked in and uh, ready for publication. And anything found after that is sort of mock snicks at that point. Okay, next slide. And um, this is sort of a depiction of the way you may see feedback appear. Um, and I usually just go line by line in order and, and give them what they need. Uh, you know, you can click on the bubbles and a margin will pop up and it'll say reviewer number three requests, you know, that you make this change. Next slide. Um, here are some good tips for publishing and, and some cautionary things. So um, there's what's called open access journals and, and they'll sort of advertise themselves. It, you know, your smart devices will automatically start sort of showing the patterns of your searches and interests. And so all of a sudden you'll find yourself getting emails from journals and things and conferences you've never heard of that make it sound like you're gonna be the keynote speaker if you pay $3,000 to fly to Singapore or for uh, the mere cost of $995 you can publish in their journal. Um, I, I'd say you should put the effort into doing it the way that John has introduced and I've talked about because it's it's not worth putting all that time and effort to have your your work buried in a, a non-peer reviewed journal that costs you money and, and likely to be read by no one. Um, in, in rare cases where essentially you're self-publishing, there may be value into if you really did exhaustive work and can't find a way to get something published just to get it out there in print. Um, but the benefits of of, of uh, peer review journals is the opportunity that they're going to be included in, you know, uh, search engines like Silver Platter or Eric, or the Pilots database or the Library of Congress and so on. And anybody usually affiliated with the university will have access to a variety of those platforms, as will their students. And so um, you, you have the opportunity to uh, have your work captured, and then it leads to collaboration and networking. It's a thrill, actually, if somebody says, I can I have your paper? I'm interested in your work. And they they cold call you. I remember reaching out to a couple in Australia about a paper I read, and they were thrilled that an American reached halfway around the globe to discuss their, their paper with them. And they're very happy to share it. And now there are websites like ResearchGate, kind of a Facebook page for researchers where you can list your work and, and people can ask you if they can have a copy of your paper. In some cases, like with Taylor Francis as li listed here, they may charge a fee for access to non-authors um, uh, to have access to, to work. And so you can do a single download of a paper or an entire journal. Uh, next slide, please. And um, this is, the, I guess I got ahead of myself a little, but this is kind of the cautionary tale about sort of predatory journals and publications and what to worry about. Again, um, they'll use aggressive solicitation tactics and, and make it seem like, uh, you know, this is a prestigious opportunity. And they'll ask you to review for them. They'll ask you to present to them. They'll ask you to publish with them. Um, and uh, it can be very seductive. Um, if you're, and also, if you end up publishing like a monogram or a book with them, you're unlikely to really make any kind of money or get the support you need. You're, you're, for a paperback, for example, it might cost $90 for a book that, if you published it through a normal firm, might be you know $20. And so no one's going to buy it, even if it is available out there on Amazon. Uh, next slide, please. And so, uh, you know, just to kind of double tap a couple of the comments John made, and I welcome your comments again, John, here at the end. This can be overwhelming, time consuming, um, uh, you know, 
patience is really key here. Um, mentorship is important. I think that's why John really spearheaded this for our organization. And because um, even if you've published before, doesn't mean you're really necessarily helpful in getting others to publish. Uh, I think John has put together a really nice way of thinking about this process, but and having multiple mentors, maybe somebody who's good at looking at your methodology, somebody who's just a good editor of your work, somebody who understands which journals are more likely to take the kind of work you're doing. You know, if you're using like a grounded theory approach versus a, you know, a quantitative approach, there are different journals that take different types of uh, rigor uh, when it comes to methodologies. Um, um, aim small, miss small, you know, I think if you, there, there are a lot of issues that you can peel the onion back on and probably make a career of studying. Don't feel like you have to squeeze everything into one uh, manuscript that you've done. Um, and probably, frankly, if you're an academic, that's not a smart strategy. You want to try to milk your major efforts uh, as long as you can and in as many manuscripts and presentations as you can. Uh, and then finally, uh, this is something that the military taught me, but use a timeline, a backwards plan from the deadlines that the journal has established when they give you feedback or from a deadline that you might need to advance your work. Um, if you're presenting at a conference, uh, make sure that you have everything in order with yourself and your co-authors, because a lot of times people will get the manuscript or the abstract submission paperwork into for to a conference with all the CME paperwork, but they don't have their CV in order, their bio in order, a picture ready. And so then you end up missing the opportunity because maybe one of your co-authors just didn't have their act together. So you wanna make sure everybody's ready to go before you start the submission process and let everybody have some deadlines. And then uh, carving out time. John likes to work incrementally. I, I have to be like in a cabin in the woods for like two days uninterrupted and I'll, I'll throw up on a piece of paper. And so, um, you know, it, it just uh, really depends on where it works for you, but you definitely, it's gonna definitely be time consuming. I think John's method is probably the better one um, because you're kind of maintaining that stream of consciousness. But, you know, I find when I get busy, it's one of those things that slides to the right on my calendar a lot. Um, and, and so you definitely have to make time for it. It's not gonna write itself though. And that's one of those things that I tell myself uh, when I'm, when I'm working on a project like this, John, anything to add? Nope. I think that touches on all of the key points. All right, great. Uh, Lisa, I'm going to turn it back to you then. And thank you so much on behalf of John and I for this opportunity. And we welcome oh, your question. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you um, both so much. And you'll see a bunch of stuff in the chat. I was just sort of underscoring different things you were talking about. And we have some resources on our SMCI website. And, you know, thanks to, to John and Jeff, we'll put these slides uh, with the link to this lecture on the website uh, shortly. But we just want to open it up now. If you want to take your, um, Selena, we could take the slides down. And uh, if you want to take yourselves off mute and ask a question. And while you're thinking of one, um, I don't know if, if John or Jeff, either of you have a favorite journal that you've been successful working with? That's one question and favorites. Um, and then also just from start to finish, if I miss this, I apologize, but you know, what's the average time that it takes when, you know, well, to, to, to starting the paper or submitting the paper and getting it accepted? Well, I'll tell you now right up front, especially since COVID, it's th the turnaround from journals has slowed down by about two to four months. Uh, and so um, I would say, you know, writing a paper, especially if it needs IRB approval um, or institutional approval for like public release, I, I would say probably six to eight months for that. And then maybe another three to four months for turn. So you're looking at about a year, mm -hmm. probably one of my favorite journals that has a slower turnaround, but a higher acceptance rate since for an interdisciplinary crowd is called Reflections, Narratives of the Professional Helping. And it's a good journal because you don't have to have a lot of data. They really want a um, practitioner's experiential uh, story. So what's it like in my case as a social worker to, to advance HRO principles for the Veterans Health Administration? And what are the barriers? What are the stories from the field? Um, and, and you can give some anecdotal data um, 
or give some indication that what you, the process you're using is working to advance the social justice issue or scientific issue. But it's really a way for different disciplines to have a dialogue about a particular issue that they probably know something about. So I like that one, especially for beginning writers, um, you know, as opposed to having to have all your data enough. But if you've just done a dissertation or thesis and you have data, I probably wouldn't go there. I'd go to something that's in your field, like John said, with maybe a slightly lower impact score, but is going to be immediately accepted by the, the group of people you're interested in, like in my case, being a retired medical service corps officer you know maybe something like military medicine which is an international you know medical journal but isn't going to be difficult like the new england journal of medicine I, I don't recommend going for something like that on your first try you know unless you know unless you've done something pretty awesome right out of the gates you know that you think would well it would take could you say that journal name again it was reflections of yeah it's a strange title it's called reflections narratives of the professional helping Okay. Okay, great. And then Maggie, you had a question. Do you want to come off mute yeah. and ask it? I saw her question. I, Maggie's not shy, so maybe she can't hear me. But Oh, sorry. I was double muted. <laughs> <laughs> um, but sometimes I am muted unexpectedly. Um, so... <laughs> Thank you so much for um, sharing the summary of information. And I think if we could have it on the website, certainly that would be a really wonderful resource because I found the step-by-step, -step, um, you know, your description really helpful, including um, your description of predatory uh, journals, which is the first time that I've seen, but certainly to take that into consideration. I was just wondering, um, in your experience um, and also your opinion, are there special factors that one ought to consider when publishing QI work, as opposed to some of the more traditional sort of observational studies, secondary analysis of, you know, big, huge database, or even randomized clinical trials? I think just because even, you know, really established journals like New England Journal of Medicine, JAMA, um, some of the subspecialty journals, um, sometimes it could be hard to get QI work uh, published in there because I think the setup is a little bit different yep. at the get-go. Yeah, that, that, that's a really great question. And um, what I have found over the past year to be really helpful is to kind of um, look at different journals to see how they format, how they lay out um, their QI projects. Like some journals are pretty strict about requiring that Squire guidelines are, are used, whereas others aren't. Um, and so for me, that's been the best approach is to see what has been published and, and, and what the format and the style ha have been, because um, colleagues of mine working on high reliability for the VHA, we have published a couple of QI projects, um, which I'm happy to share with you um, over the past year. And I have to say, it was a little bit different than I'm used to with um, publishing in strictly clinical nursing journals. Um, and so I, I, I think that the best advice that I can give you is to, is to look at different journals to see what their formatting and what their style is. I think that would be, the, um, that would be of, of most help. You know, and it's sometimes having an interdisciplinary discussion, Margaret, is uh, Maggie, about that is really important because um, you may become aware of something that you didn't know existed that is perfect for your QI article. Um, you know, to John's point, and I'm working on one right now with uh, two physicians from a medical center in California, and um, because their quality and uh, their, what is I'm looking for, their residency trained essentially in quality and safety, which I didn't even know was a residency, and I had actually taught at mm -hmm. a medical school at one point, there was a whole range of journals just associated with that field. And in fact, when we first started looking for journals to potentially put it in, they didn't know that there were some of these journals either, uh, but some of their mentors did and said, this might be a perfect uh, paper for that um, particular venue. Um, so you, know, you can find that you're able to open up the aperture a little bit in terms of choices when you cross streams with nurses, physicians, social workers, and whoever in the, in the medical community. Because while one particular group may not have a lot of journals that would accept something like that, there might be something that a group that really does and advances that work. And 
And then finally, I would just say there are organizations like AHRQ, you know, that often will have suggested places uh, to put your work as well. So some of these professional organizations want us to, you know, to help further our work by, even if you're not working with them, to get your work in the right venue. Sam, did you want to, did you want to, uh, we've got a professional uh, evaluator here uh, on the call. Did you want to ask any questions? Sure. So yes, I'm Samantha Kling. I'm from the Evaluation Sciences Unit, and we work with like all the department, any department division uh, at Stanford We want that wants our help. And we tend to publish in a lot of fields. And often I run into the big question, like suggested reviewers. Yeah. And hard to identify people when I'm not intimately in each of these fields, but any advice on how to identify help, like be helpful to the editorial board and not just suggest the top scientists who probably get a thousand requests a year. Yeah, that, that that's a really great question. I, I actually have never um, faced that until I started working on uh, publications related to um, high reliability with the VHA. Um, if somebody asks me within my own field, which is nursing, if I have suggestions, I can immediately think of a lot of people that I can suggest as, as reviewers. It's a lot tougher when you're publishing in a field or publishing um, on, on a topic where you really don't have a whole lot of experience. And so what I do is I reach out to um, people I know, you know, colleagues of mine. So for example, for the work that we do on high reliability, we frequently um, have guest speakers that, that come and talk to the, the leader coaches. And so I usually reach out to them to ask them if they have suggestions. So I think, I think just, you know, networking with people that are in that particular field is, is probably the best way to approach it. But it is tough. And, and there are times when I do submit a manuscript and I can't recommend reviewers. And, and oftentimes they may only want one person, like being a military social worker puts me sort of in a unique niche, you know, so, um, you know, they may just want one military person to say, you know, if I'm trying to get it in a pure social work journal with no military experience, they may want one person who says, yeah, that's, that's correct. His, his, his uh, positions on these things are true. Um, so they mm -hmm. just want somebody to verify it. But more often than not, I'm finding it, that it's rare for people to ask you to solicit your own um, editors, but it's not completely uncommon. Yeah. Um, or if you're presenting at a conference, you may have opportunities come to you, uh, in which case you could even ask people while you're in that venue, uh, who would you suggest um, or, you know, would be somebody good to have look at my work. Um, and sometimes the person who actually solicited you will recommend colleagues of theirs. Might have time for one more question. Is there one more question out there? I'm trying to wait the, the requisite. Is it 10 seconds? I don't know how many seconds. <laughs> <laughs> I'm terrible. I can't, I can't not talk. Um, and Jeff, I saw that you put your contact information in there. And John, if you're willing to share yours, um, we'll share it with this audience. But um, to give people time to get to their next Zoom. Um, and thank you both so much. Thank you. I, I was so impressed when I heard you speak um, in our leader coach group. And, and these are the way you arrange the resources in your slides, um, it will it will be accessible to to many many more people than who are able to join us today. So, so thank you both so very much, and and um, I am always so humbled to uh, be in the company of such awesome leader coaches. So, so thank you both so much. Yeah, and Lisa, if you need any of the um, resources, just just let me know. Thank you so much. And thanks, thanks for everybody. honoring us with the thank opportunity, Lisa. Appreciate it. Thank you all. Yeah, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks so much. Bye. Thank you all.